Well, hello, free people of the Rocky Mountain region, and welcome to this Free State Colorado interview. Today, I'm joined by Peter Bodie. Peter is a longtime community volunteer, political pundit, author, and candidate for Colorado House District 28. Well, Peter, I hope you are well, and thank you for joining me today. Uh, thanks for this opportunity of uh, being on your show. Well, Peter, first off, tell us a little bit about yourself and why you decided to run for office. Well, uh, I've lived in South Jeffco for 40 years and raised a family here. And uh, my wife and I have been volunteers at whatever level, whatever's going on in the schools, um, in the church, international, even going to Kenya and Uganda and Honduras, different things, just sort of stepping up into little roles and uh, whatever it, it took just not in a big way, just in little things, but for a long time. And I've also become somewhat involved in politics. And uh, when, uh, when an opportunity opened up, I decided it was time for me to step up and try and undo some of the damage that the Democrats are doing down in the legislature because of my faith and my love of Colorado. Um, it seemed like the thing that needed to be done. Well, Peter, before we started, you were telling me that you have been to every county in Colorado. Uh, what led you to travel the whole state? Well, uh, I've been a hydrologist, uh, water consultant uh, at the same company. I just retired after about 40 years. And so because of that, I've worked on projects, water supply, water rights, environmental projects all around Colorado which gets me to a lot of places and sometimes in neighboring states. And then also my wife and I uh, wrote the first statewide hiking guide. Came out in 1984, we had a newborn on our back. We were out hiking the trails and that was the first statewide guide. And then we wrote another one. And then later on, we, uh, we wrote two books about the history of skiing called The Lost Ski Areas of Colorado. So between all those, and just going out and recreating in this beautiful state, uh, I ended up having visited, worked in, traveled through, stayed overnight in, camped in, whatever you hiked, you know, in literally every county in the state of Colorado. Well, that's awesome. We, we truly have a beautiful and wonderful place. And like you said, it's so unfortunate to see what some of these politicians have done uh, to make life more expensive, more difficult. Of course, there's a lot of issues with crime going on right now. But Peter, what would you say are some of the big issues that really motivated you? You talked about the damage being done by Colorado Democrats. Uh, what do you mean specifically? Well, uh, I mean, they, they seek, uh, let me just say this, I'm, I'm an environmentalist. And I walked in the first Earth Day back in 1970. I was just a teenager. And so I'm, and I chose an environmental career, wrote hiking guides, so I love the outdoors of the state, but the environmental movement kind of left me and they became fear mongering, bunch of socialists associating with socialists, but they started attacking the very foundation of the economy and the, the culture of this state, which is, you know, farming and ranching and the energy industry, which makes all of the other things possible that we love. The, the economy is such that we can set aside, you know, wilderness areas and, uh, and the most environmentally conscious people on the planet are people who make their living off the land, the farmers and the ranchers. And so it's gone to where we try and punish, our legislature tries to punish those people that have made Colorado what it is. And so, you know, we all want to protect the environment. That's why most people move to the state. But all the regulations and things, and they actively are attacking the energy industry. So I want to protect some of those things that make Colorado great. 
Well, and I think you uh, brought up a great point too about just like the attacks on the economy and this overregulation, because you know when when politicians like that impoverish society, make it harder for businesses to be successful, lower the standard of living, makes it a lot harder for people to be environmentally conscious, right? I mean, you almost it's almost a luxury because you, you look at other parts of the world. You talked about um, Africa um, previously, and you know you see some of these places um, where there's a lot of economic. Um, opportunity because the people are struggling so much and you know some people somebody who's starving or you know just trying to get by it's really hard for them to focus on trying to be environmentally conscious you know it's almost you need that kind of level a uh, standard of of living a certain level of the standard of living and a certain level of economic wealth in order to to have that kind of consciousness i would say well and when people when the middle class is successful just think about your little neighborhood people take care of their lawns and they don't throw trash out because that's their neighborhood. That's their state. But when you have poverty, uh, there's a lot of trash. It's, it's an unhealthy place. And so a good economy is sound environmental uh, policy. And the more healthy the environment is, there's more incentive of the residents to take care of the place they live in. And there's more resources to do that. It's just the opposite of what people think sometimes about the environmental movement, you know, capitalism is evil and all that. And it's just, it's exactly the opposite. Right. And capitalism enables the higher quality of life, the higher standard of living. That's pretty much a prerequisite for that kind of environmental consciousness. Yeah. I mean, Boulder, Boulder thinks of themselves as environmentally conscious. But they're one of the richest counties in the state. I mean, the, the price of a home in Boulder, they don't have a lot of poor people unless they're hanging out on the mall or whatever. But I mean, it's just part of it's it's part of the system that when you have a healthy economy, the environmental uh, environment benefits. And when you have a socialist system, you know, some of the worst pollution was in communist countries. At Soviet Union. I'm sure Venezuela isn't a real healthy place right now. And so, and I've seen that in Africa and things, in places, you know, people just throw their trash out and just part of the culture. And, and some of that culture comes, comes here. I mean, look at the border, the trash, the people just throw stuff away when they're coming across the border. And it's just, it's the independent freedom loving culture of America doesn't uh, produce a lot of pollution. It, people take care of their environment. So, anyway, that's the difference I see. And and overregulating everything that they're doing in the legislature, even the things they think are protecting the environment, the unintended consequences are almost always worse. When you talked about attacks on the energy industry, attacks on agriculture, the food producers in our society, I mean, that sounds like an attack on civilization itself. You know, if you're taking away, you're making it harder for people to produce energy, making it more difficult for people to produce food. I mean, driving up those costs and, and shutting down those businesses. I mean, that's the... the that's like the foundation of civilization is to be able to have electricity, to have, you know, a cheaper, cleaner, abundant uh, energy sources, and also just to have uh, access to, to inexpensive, high quality food. I mean, you, it's amazing that these legislators and this name of these agendas that they, they run on or that they support are really attacking some of the, the foundations of our civilization. Yeah, and especially energy, people don't understand that the entire Western civilization that we all enjoy is based on cheap energy. And that's what made America great. That's what produced our Western culture. And it's not an evil thing. It's a good thing. People in other countries would love to have that culture, you know, and that abundance. And uh, so when you go to destroy that and, and, and you raise energy prices and who gets hurt the most, the very people that the left claims to care about people living in poverty or in middle class suffer the most from high energy prices and high and the resulting high food prices and everything else. And I don't know how you knock some sense into them, but you know, my job is to go down there and bring some common sense to the legislature. 
when you talked about your career as a hydrologist, I mean, water is definitely a major issue here in the Western United States, Colorado in particular. We've seen so much growth, so much development. And of course, you know, no growth in the water resources that we have available. I mean, how would you say that the state government is doing in terms of managing Colorado's water? Well, um, I think they do a pretty good job. Um, as long as the government doesn't overregulate it, because there's kind of a, a freedom in Colorado in we have water rights. And so you can own a right to water almost like a property right. And so there are changes. Water moves to where it needs to be by people selling and changing their water uses to something else. And that is all adjudicated in a court system. It's not 100% regulated by the state. There, people can make choices and there's a court system and they have to apply to do things, but the bureaucracy does not have complete control over that process. People have the opportunity to act in a way they want to. There's some freedom in the movement of water. And even though in some ways it's expensive and people fight over water, which is expensive, but at the same time, the water meet, moves to where it needs to be for development of the state. At the same time, people can buy water and preserve it. There's conservation easements and things like that that preserve some of the ranches in the mountains and some of the beautiful places. So. It's an economic system. It's not perfect, but it it has an opportunity for capitalism or freedom to kind of move within the system. So I think it's a good system, but it's not perfect. You know, I I used to swear about parts of it all the time, <laughs> but but it's uh, it works. Yeah, and it's much better to have the market. Uh, kind of making those decisions about the price of water, where it should be supplied, where it should be provided, where it should be sold, rather than some politicians or bureaucrats, because we, we kind of know how that would work out, right? Where you have these political powers rewarding their friends and their patrons and kind of, you know, at the expense of everybody else. So, yeah, the market's definitely the preferred mechanism for for distributing water. Um, well, never mind. I'm not going to say water flows towards money. <laughs> That's... That's one of the things. So there's good and bad points to that. Uh, That's a good point. Well, Peter, we've seen a lot of bad policy come out of the state legislature in Denver, but just this year we saw a bill passed by your opponent, House Bill 24 at 1344. It's costing the jobs of workers in the plumbing industry, and it's going to raise the cost of plumbing work all across the state. Uh, what can you tell us about this? Well, the the bill started as a renewal of what of a bill that was sunsetting. So certain laws are created for a certain period and then they have to be re, redone or, or re-upped, I guess. Um, and so this was the plumbing board sunset bill. Basically there's a, a state agency, a plumbing board that regulates the licensing of plumbers. And within that, those regulations, there was an exemption for backflow device testing that certified testers, they have to go through training, can test these devices without being a licensed plumber. My opponent at the last minute slipped in at the request of some plumbers to make that testing require a licensed plumber. Now, the problem is that there's many problems with it. Backflow testing devices prevent water in a building or in an irrigation system uh, from, if there's a problem in your system, that it prevents that water from flowing back into the public water supply and contaminating the water supply. And there are public health regulations that require testing of all large systems, like any commercial building, any, any large irrigation system. Many homes have these on there their own little backyard irrigation systems. And uh, there's a requirement that those devices be tested once a year if they're commercial. And then those test results get turned over to the water utility. The water utility gathers them up and says, 
that they comply with the requirement that it's either 90 or 95 percent of all their devices, backflow devices, have been tested within a year. If they fail to turn over those test results, the health department, by their regulations, is required to issue a public health warning to that water district, or it might be your apartment complex, whatever didn't fail to get the testing done. Now, there's a whole industry that grew up of small businesses called the backflow device testing uh, or prevention, backflow prevention device testing industry. Lots of small businesses, hundreds of individuals all across the state that have been doing these tests for decades. And they were exempt from being licensed plumbers. They have a lot of training to do it, but they do that one thing. And so when the plumbers asked that this requirement be changed to require a licensed plumber. They were thinking about, oh, we can get more business, I presume. I have no idea what they were thinking, but that's what happened. Well, it turns out there aren't enough licensed plumbers to do the testing. So for example, the Denver Water Department, the, the law went into effect July 1st. By the end of July, the Denver Water Department, which supplies a million and a half people, has 44,000 of these backflow devices, was 40% behind on their testing for July. So they're in danger of getting uh, a notice from the health department that they're out of compliance. And in the letter they wrote, they said that one notice that they have to issue to their customers costs a quarter of a million dollars in postage and printing. One notice, and they there's not enough people to do the testing. So it's worse, I mean, it's bad enough that they put a small industry of, of small businesses potentially out of business, their livelihood that they've been doing for decades. But on top of that, they put every single water utility in the state of Colorado in danger of being in violation of the public health laws. Now, they kind of panicked when they found this out, so they put a stay on it until the rest of the law completely goes into effect April 1st. So there's a stay until April 1st. At that point, all these backflow testers will be out of business, and every single water utility in the state could be in jeopardy of violating health laws. Not a, not a, it's not a small problem. <laughs> I call it the big backflow blunder and my opponent was the lead sponsor on the bill and with one other legislature the sponsor of that amendment it's just stupid and wow it's, yeah it's a result of passing 500 bills in the state i mean they're drunk on power and then along come two democrats who are under the influence of special interests, you know, and they car as a car wreck. And my, my saying is, it's time to take away their keys, the Democrats keys, and bring some sober Republicans to the legislature. And I'm a sober Republican. Well, it seems to be an example of, you know, one industry using the political political machine, you know, this, uh, this political power to really put their competition out of business, right? I mean, you got these big plumbing companies who have influence over the state legislature are able to get them to add this to this bill. And like you said, there's 500 bills. So very few people uh, down there are paying attention, especially something like this, right? The plumbing sunset review board. I mean, how many people are showing up for that one, right? They're not paying attention to the bill. Special interests get these politicians to sneak this in there in this amendment. And now all of a sudden, you know, so many people can be out of work. Plumbing industry is able to capture all of this industry. And of course, it's a distortion in the market, changes how the process has been working for a long time, and then causes this shortage of workers leading to this expensive uh, blunder, like you said, where you know Denver Water is not able to do what they need to do. They have to spend money notifying the people. They're not able to accomplish the, the, the safety techniques needed to ensure that water is clean and safe to drink here in the Denver metro area. I mean, like you said, it's it's a big deal. You know, uh, the safety and cleanliness of our water is a major issue, right? <laughs> yes. And, and I'm not sure it was even the whole plumbing industry. I think it was just a couple of individuals or 
local union that that wanted it. I'm not even convinced the entire plumbing industry wanted it. As I, I spoke with someone, an attorney at the Denver Water Department, and she said, well, the reason there were all these backflow testers as a separate little industry is because the plumbers didn't want to do it for years and years and years. And as she said, it wasn't sexy enough for them. And, and just someone just thought, well, we should have this work. I'm not even convinced all of the plumbing industry in the Colorado wanted it, but it's just a major screw up. It was at the last minute, the bill had gone through two readings, amendment added at the end. They didn't invite other people potentially affected. They didn't even think about it. And so this is what happens when you have Democrats drunk on power passing. Uh, they introduced 700 bills and they passed 500 of them. That is not the way to run government. And your life and my life and no one's life in the state of Colorado is better because they passed 500 bills. I mean, would it be better if they passed 1,000? You know, it's just ridiculous and it needs to stop. And this is an egregious example, but I'm sure there's many others. Oh, definitely. Definitely. I'm sure this happens all the time. You know, uh, during my legislative uh, kind of reviews I did this year, the legislative live streams doing every week, uh, did that during the legislative session earlier this year. I mean, there are so many of these little nuances in these bills where there's so much potential for abuse or potential for somebody to benefit at the expense of somebody else. And like you said, and it's not really a sexy issue, as you said. So not everybody's paying attention and, and it's very easy for this kind of thing to happen, unfortunately. So, yeah, I mean, it seems like they're drunk on power. I uh, couldn't agree with you more on that. Um, but, you know, uh, P Peter, what's that uh, hat you got in the background there? I wanted to ask you about uh, that one. I got one here. This is my motto. Make Colorado, Colorado again. And people can read into it what they want, but it basically says Colorado is changing and not for the better. And we welcome people. It's a beautiful state, but don't bring your politics from the East Coast or the West Coast with you. And that's what's changing Colorado dramatically. And it's not for the better. Well said. Yeah, definitely. Uh, can you tell us a little bit real quick? I should have asked you at the beginning, but where is Colorado House District 28? Uh, it's in South Jefferson County. So the the north end is uh, the south end of Lakewood and then west to C-470. East, it ends in Denver, Wadsworth, Kipling, uh, some of the parts of Denver. And then it goes south to about Coal Mine with a little, they draw all these weird things and a little bit goes all the way down to Chatfield Reservoir. But but basically I call it South Central Jeffco. Or, okay. you know, there's, there's suburbs further south and there's Lakewood to the north and it's kind of in between. Awesome. Well, Peter, what else, what else do you want to leave us with today? Well, uh, vote for me and uh, support my campaign. But um, I'm doing this because I just need someone need to step up and I'm happy to do it. I'm not launching a new career. My goal is not set to become governor or anything like that. I'm just doing this to serve my community and to repair some of the damage that's been done in the legislature as much as I can. And hopefully we'll elect other sober <laughs> Republicans to help that because we have to flip some seats and to, to stop their super majority because a super majority is just a danger to all of the citizens and small businesses in Colorado. Oh, definitely. And I think, you know, a lot of Colorado's voters, especially unaffiliated voters, uh, want to see some of this extremism go away. You know, the the left has gotten so extreme, like you said, they have all the power. And unfortunately, some of their worst elements have had a little too much control over some of the policy decisions here in Colorado. So, you know, I think the the appetite for the voters for a little bit more balance, a little bit more moderation, and a little bit more sanity, I think it's there uh, more so than ever before. And and I talked to a lot of unaffiliated voters and uh, they're ready. They like what I have to say. And, uh, you know, I say that the Democrat Party is the party control. And they want to control your vote, your voice, your pocketbook. 
and they also want to control your children, which is some of the worst of it. And um, Republicans are the party of freedom and faith and family and and sensible, common sense legislation. And we don't need 500 new bills every. We should be the if we do a lot of bills, it should be get rid of some of the stuff we already have. So awesome. That's what well, I'm I really. Trying. Perfect. Well, I really appreciate your time, Peter. Thank you for taking time out of your campaign schedule. Uh, I thought this information was really important to get out to people because it's such a such a big example of how these legislators can can reward one business or one industry at the expense of others. And it's something that most people don't even think about or aren't aware of, but uh, just a perfect example of kind of how government works. And so I appreciate you bringing this to light and getting it out there and, and uh, good luck on your campaign. Okay. Thanks for the opportunity. Bodie for Colorado.com. I was told I had to repeat that several times. So <laughs> thanks. Thanks for this opportunity. It's been a real pleasure to talk with you. Perfect, sir. We'll take care and uh, uh, we'll talk to you later. Okay.